Hi, I'm Barbara Call, Senior Director of Content Strategy and Operations for IDG, and I'll be your host and moderator for today's webcast, The Evolution of Multi-Cloud Architecture. I have two speakers joining me today. First up is Michael Johnson, Director of Cloud Strategy and Cloud Business Development for Worldwide Technologies. Welcome, Michael. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Thanks, Barbara. Happy to be here. Uh, so, as you mentioned, my name is Michael Johnson. Uh, I'm Director of Cloud Strategy with Worldwide. Uh, I have been in the technology arena for a little over 15 years, with the last 10 to 12 of it being primarily focused on cloud technologies. Uh, I joined Worldwide uh, almost two years ago now to help co-lead their cloud practice, and my responsibilities here include uh, both building out and developing our multi-cloud consulting practice and those are the individuals that really help align to customers' organizational strategies, uh, help them define what uh, success looks like, and then marry that back to uh, a technology enablement plan. Uh, I also have responsibility for our partner relationships with the major cloud providers, uh, and then lastly, a team of, of customer success and field advisors that help our sales teams and customers build uh, you know, long-term plans around how they're going to leverage multi-cloud in their, their environment or to achieve their business initiatives. All right, great. Thank you. Nice to have you. Also joining us today is Jeremy Weinstein, Director of U.S. Cloud Solution Providers at Intel Corporation. Welcome, Jeremy, and tell us a little bit about yourself. Thank you, and, and good to be here. So name again, Jeremy Weinstein, uh, Director of U.S. Cloud Solution Providers. I've also been in the technology arena, like Michael, for over 15 years, and uh, now I'm supporting uh, Intel's cloud consumption activity. Uh, across the United States. And so Intel's role in the ecosystem has typically been to optimize hardware uh, as well as traditional and, and cloud native software and solutions to run best for our customers on Intel technology. We have thousands of engineers focused here. My specific role and the role of my team is to support our partners and customers to accelerate data center modernization efforts and catalyze action in stalled activities by removing key friction points. And so our goal is to provide thought leadership, guidance, data recommendations uh, to increase confidence around cloud solution strategies and workload placement. And we work with partners across the ecosystem from MSPs, SIs, uh, management platforms, and the cloud providers as well. So great to be here. Excellent. Thank you. Nice to have you. So I'd like to kick off today's webcast by sharing some of our latest IDG research findings. Our 2020 cloud survey gathered responses on a variety of topics, including cloud, multi-cloud, and more. We surveyed 551 IT decision makers, of which 69% were IT executives. And specifically, I'd like to focus in on our multi-cloud findings. You can see here that more than half our respondents are using multiple public clouds for a variety of benefits. And the top five benefits are, in order, greater platform and service flexibility, improving disaster recovery and business continuity, best of breed and service options, cost savings and optimization, and avoiding vendor lock-in. But adopting a multi-cloud approach is not without challenges, as these results show. The main downside is flexibility, affecting close to half the respondents, followed by increased cost of training and hiring, increased cost due to cloud management and security challenges, and increased security risk. So, Michael and Jeremy, what are your thoughts on these results? So, Barbara, um, I think from my perspective, we see uh, a lot of similar findings and, and patterns with our customers, um, whether they're intentionally pursuing a multi-cloud strategy or they're faced with scrambling to consider uh, how they're going to manage multi-cloud due to um, shadow IT or acquisitions or uh, things of that matter. I think uh, multi-cloud is becoming pervasive and in, in through our customer base. And uh, I think it behooves organizations to at least uh, understand and consider the aspects of multi-cloud, uh, whether they intentionally plan to pursue that strategy or not, uh, just because there are several advantages and potential challenges that arise, as, as your last couple slides pointed out, and, and having an intentional plan for uh, when those things do um, come to fruition helps organizations both be more agile in how they, they adjust to those changing demands, but also how they leverage them to their advantage. Yeah, and, and Michael, I, I, I agree. We, we see the same thing that, you know, multi-cloud has evolved 
organically at, at many organizations based on preferences of individual business units. And uh, we found that if not choreographed and well thought through, the complexity of managing can be a real issue and, and restructuring can be can be very costly. And so working with a partner like WWT, you know, Intel can help avoid um, some of those sort of costly missteps. And Jeremy, I think, you know, from our perspective, uh, we see a lot of that evolution uh, occurring because, you know, domain or technology is no longer solely the domain of IT. Um, it's really part of every organization, uh, every business unit within an organization, whether we're talking about finance or HR or sales or marketing uh, and in virtually every industry. So uh, the organization as a whole has to consider how technology is going to play a part and how they're going to leverage it to their advantage. Uh, so I think that's really driving uh, a, a transformation of the organization uh, as they look at how IT fits into their overall portfolio. Yeah, fully, fully agree. And as IT, you want to enable that flexibility and, and creativity and innovation throughout the business units, but you need to put some sort of uh, boundaries around it to to make it manageable and sustainable. And as such, um, as we see that transition and, and we see folks adopting uh, multiple strategies to unlock that innovation and that agility, um, it really comes to your point, I think, about how IT uh, allows the different parts of the business to operate as they best see fit, but still guarantee that there's the, the right levels of control and governance and compliance. And so I think that becomes really the art of multi-cloud and, and, and how when it's done properly, uh, you can can enable both of those two pretty pretty difficult initiatives of of really driving innovation and and, and being agile, but uh, still ensuring that you're uh, compliant and and governed in the ways that you need to be to run your organization. And so, what we're seeing is that really that drive to enable innovation and agility is is pushing organizations forward in their pursuit of technology and how they're leveraging it. I think one of the things that organizations have started to realize is that traditional data centers and and maybe the traditional ways that IT has been leveraged previously are not necessarily a differentiator. A lot of organizations use the same tools and kind of go about them the same way. Uh, And and it's really about how do you differentiate and enable whatever your your core mission, your, your core business is, and Cloud is really providing some advantages to organizations and how they enable that, uh, both by being more on the cutting edge of, of net new developments um, and also accelerating their, their time to market and, and the tools and, and technologies that are at their disposal. So Michael, the, the rise in, in public cloud, hybrid and, and multi-cloud shown here is, is really quite significant. Um, Stung on what we're seeing in the ecosystem uh, in, I guess, uh, 2020 due to uh, COVID and the effects on, on, the, on the, the enterprises, what are you guys hearing about the pace in which customers are exploring and executing their, their public hybrid and multi-cloud strategies? So Jeremy, that's a great question. I think we see with our customers uh, that they're adopting a pretty traditional journey uh, as it comes to introducing the cloud. And as you can see in, see in the slide, it really starts around establishing a small center of excellence or a group to explore cloud. Uh, they usually go and experiment and and, and try to get their bearings and what the technology is and how they can benefit from it. That leads them to then building a foundation and start thinking about how it can play a role in, in their production environments and, and move kind of out of just that experimental phase, uh, which then further progresses into how they get workloads and, and technologies into the cloud and then start to iterate and, and mature those those technologies to fit the new platform. And so it's a very linear process we see in, in while it, it is uh, advantageous to organizations because they can learn and fail fast and, and kind of cut their teeth on it, uh, it does present some considerable challenges for them uh, as they go through that journey. And, and a couple of the, the primary challenges we see organizations face is enabling the broader uh, organization. So beyond the team that, that really kind of went in first and experimented and learned, how do they then take that knowledge uh, and that time spent and, and drive value with the broader organization and enable folks. And um, it, that's a really difficult challenge that a lot of organizations face. And then the second thing we see uh, pretty common with our customers is they hit a wall in their their momentum. So they've learned about cloud. They've established a, a foundation for that. They may have migrated the lowest hanging fruit in a lift and shift scenario, but how do they account for 
uh, the more complex workloads or things that maybe shouldn't migrate in an as-is scenario. Um, and, and oftentimes we see a plateau in that, that adoption stage. Uh, and then the last thing that's pretty common is we see organizations that do move things in a lift and shift scenario and, and kind of a like for like. And that really doesn't deliver the innovation that they expect because they're really operating the same way they were before, just in a new platform or in a new set of technologies. So oftentimes their targeted ROI or their, what they're expecting to achieve out of enabling cloud uh, is just not met, quite honestly. And so the next phase we kind of see in the maturation process is customers start to go down the cloud native path. So beyond lift and shift and, and maybe playing with a one or two production workloads in a DR or business continuity strategy, they really try to develop their processes to do their net new development uh, in, in a cloud native format or with the cloud native tools. And this certainly can accelerate your adoption of cloud and accelerate your value of cloud but it also introduces uh, some additional risk. And, and one of those main things is, is now you start to become a little bit siloed in, in your operations and your platforms start to look pretty independent. And while you can still achieve value by having them isolated from one another, the real value of cloud is when you can start to um, integrate the multiple platforms, take a best of breed approach, and then layer over some consistency or communities uh, that can share artifacts, can share process, can share lessons learned to, to drive an organization's goals or achieve those outcomes. And so that's where we really think a customer um, realizes a tremendous amount of value by building an intentional strategy as they start to adopt cloud. So not to belabor the approach and, and, and slow things down from, you know, getting in and learning, but also understanding how that's going to then blend back into uh, the things that you're already doing, uh, how you have, substantial investments that may live in your data center or in a co-location facility today, and a lot of talent and familiarity with a certain set of tools. By taking an intentional approach to how you adopt multi-cloud, you can oftentimes leverage uh, a lot of the existing assets uh, in the organization and, and, and drive additional value from them. So by building that strategy and vision on the front end and being intentional about how all these platforms are going to integrate into a unified solution, we really see that organizations can, can really achieve a head start uh, in their cloud journey and remove a lot of the plateaus or barriers to the momentum that they're building. Yeah, so, Michael, your, your, your comments around sort of customer stall out is something that, that we see as well, and it's for, for numerous reasons, right? One of the big ones is um, unrealistic expectations, right, where, where they've, they've lifted and shifted a workload and then the, the cost savings that folks hope to achieve is, is just not, is not seen. Um, and then it causes them to sort of reevaluate their entire plan, and then they they totally stall out. Uh, I wonder if you see the same thing in your activities. We do. So uh, you know, and and when customers stop to take a look at that, it, it's pretty obvious why some of those things happen. You know, when you're architecting uh, in kind of in a legacy model or, or with a traditional data center, those are often really capital intensive campaigns. Um, you're planning your business out three, five, seven year. Um, cycles uh, that you're depreciating assets. So you're forecasting future demand and you're buying uh, future capacity in your instances. So when you take an instance that's sized for growth for five years and you pick it up and move it out to the cloud, you're really, in a lot of cases, are going to be over-provisioning and you're really um, neutering one of the biggest advantages of, of cloud and that's the ability to burst up or burst out kind of as as demand arises. And so by being intentional at looking at what you have today and baselining where you're at so that you can right size or appropriately size uh, for the future platforms as you modernize is really one of the key advantages to, to achieving a lot of that ROI. And, and that's an, an area that is pretty, um, I won't call it easy for customers to achieve, but I think by having an intentional plan, you absolutely can achieve it with, with little risk and, and realize some of the ROI that folks plan on when they move to the cloud. And so, so Michael, I think what you're showing here is a pretty common journey of, of what folks use when they when they move workloads into the cloud. A question for you: Why why multi cloud? Right? Why is it important to think about that in a multi cloud way versus just a you know singular public cloud? Sure, great question. So I, I think, as I mentioned earlier, whether an organization has intentions of of truly driving a multi-cloud initiative and having 
production workloads in, in, in multiple public clouds or private clouds. While there are certain advantages to that, and I think that you can achieve a best of breed strategy with the right approach and, and being intentional, short of that, it's important to consider those implications uh, and plan for those type of things because, as I mentioned before, there are drivers besides your intentional strategy that may may um, result in an organization ending up in, in those type of scenarios. So whether it be you know geographical limitations and, and requirements of your business and, and latency requirements, so uh, you know as you may standardize on a single cloud but grow operations into another uh, region of the world, you may be forced into adopting a, a different cloud provider. Um, you know, one of the other very, very common scenarios that we see is uh, organizations that uh, are heavily focused on an M&A strategy and, and are acquiring competitors or uh, other opportunities. And oftentimes they find themselves acquiring an asset that, that has a presence or a footprint in another cloud. So having a multi-cloud perspective and planning for some of those things, whether they're realized or not, is uh, we feel an appropriate strategy for uh, certainly for large organizations. And so taking that a step further uh, with the slide we have up now, you're looking at some of the common services we see organizations consume uh, from the public cloud. But going back to the siloed statement I made previously, you will see a lot of those um, technologies that are in those highlighted boxes already exist within an organization. And there are considerations that you have to um, work with uh, from a data center perspective and from existing uh, business critical workloads you have in your organization. So having an intentional strategy of how those services as they are consumed from a public cloud provider are going to fit into your broader organizational makeup and whether they're going to be siloed or integrated uh, is, is one certainly uh, important data point. Again, taking technologies and areas there that you may already have proficiency in and have made investments in, it may make sense to extend those out into the public cloud. So think of third-party ISVs running on top of a cloud platform. Those are the decisions that customers need to consider versus, you know, maybe taking whatever the, the cloud native equivalent from, from a given cloud provider is and weighing the pluses and minuses of each one of those. And then you'll also notice uh, some of the boxes that aren't highlighted. And those are considerations that are going to exist to have an enterprise class production workload running in a cloud that are not necessarily going to be provided from the cloud provider. So organizations are going to have to plan for those things around networking and access and what users need access to where and what latency requirements may come into play and how they account for those. And again, there are several strategies to accomplish that. There are direct connectivity into the clouds and the cloud providers. There's things like leveraging SD-WAN, um, several different ways that you can accomplish that goal, but it really comes down to what makes the most sense for an organization based on their business objectives and where they already have investments made. Uh, same thing as we look at a security uh, perspective. So prior, your security posture was really based on a perimeter strategy. It's who do I let inside my four walls and how do I let them have access inside there? Uh, but once you start introducing cloud into that perspective, all of a sudden uh, your, your surface grows quite a bit. Their perimeter is not as clearly defined. So you have to start migrating towards things like zero trust. And it's no longer how do I build a, a castle and moat model around my technology investments, but it's, it's how do I then give access uh, based on least privilege, uh, based on zero trust and broadening that security posture. So all of those are considerations that you're not going to be able to achieve myopically with a single cloud provider, but you're going to have to take a broader perspective as an organization. And Michael, that's, that's a great point. I think as you think through use of third-party ISVs and what you currently have on-prem versus what's available in the cloud versus the cloud-native services, the, the pace in which you can transform some of your workloads and analytics uh, up into the cloud versus, you know, uh, cloud lock-in and and uh, being beholden to the analytics within one particular cloud provider. So that that flexibility versus the, the opportunity uh, and pace of innovation is just something that that you need to think through and plan out. Completely agree. And and Jeremy, that's one of the areas where we uh, partner very closely with Intel. You guys are on the forefront of innovation and and driving a lot of that change, whether it's advances in technologies within the data center, whether that's advances in technologies uh, from an IS perspective in the cloud, 
or powering a lot of the cloud native capabilities uh, that are that are on top of Intel's technology and, and Intel's innovation. Uh, it's working closely, understanding that rate of change, uh, understanding all the innovation that you guys are helping drive and helping customers make the right decision for them based on that business outcome. So one of the things that we uh, are big proponents on is, is that in this multi-cloud world with the rate of innovation and all the different options that are available to an organization, uh, there is not a single reference architecture or one way to do things like you may have looked at, you know, in a traditional data center. It really starts to become based on your objectives and what you're trying to solve as an organization. Marrying that to a technology strategy that allows you to operate the way that you see fit, not being confined by the way you have to operate given the technology, um, and then really taking that and, and, and formulating an intentional plan. And so the technologies that enable your strategy start to become unique to every organization given existing investments, what they're trying to solve for, and it really becomes almost as unique as their DNA. But the real, the real power of unlocking that is not necessarily just the technologies you choose to implement, but it's also the way you organize around those technologies and how you start to operate to take advantage of them. And so we do spend a lot of time with our customers understanding that aspect too and, and really how you, you organize and operate given the new complexities and new innovations in the world. So we spend a lot of time talking with our customers about how they're organized currently and how they operate. So many organizations will take a traditional enterprise architecture model drive towards functional groups that concentrate on a single domain or a single expertise that they will then support across the broad organization. So if the slide you're looking at now, that's really trying to achieve um, that upper right-hand quadrant, right, of, of consistent, integrated, almost a single process. While there are certainly advantages to that and operational efficiencies and some cost savings that you, you can accomplish with that model, the biggest challenge we see is that does not necessarily foster creative thinking or innovation or agility because you start to become handcuffed by your own ways of doing things and you become interdependent on teams that aren't always readily available. So we're seeing a huge shift in the market and moving away from those kind of siloed IT functional teams and moving more towards solution groups that can be agile, can move at whatever rate of innovation they can sustain, have a holistic viewpoint across the organization. So really a blend of the business and technology coming together, driving towards a run-what-you-build type model that allows you to continually innovate. And so it's not recreating the wheel every time. It's really driving towards communities and shared artifacts and things that can be repurposed, but allowing organizations and more specifically the teams within an organization to operate as they see fit. So it's really driving ownership and control down to a lower level of the organization and really starting to take advantage of all the smart people and smart ideas you have in an organization, not being restricted by some of those those functional groups or functional teams. Yeah, and so, Mike, Michael, that idea of solution teams right. versus the centralized control, I'm, I'm sure as you work with your customers, that, that brings up a number of cultural issues that you need to try to figure out a way to work through with them before you can have successful implementations. Absolutely. So as the next slide will represent, uh, it can cause folks to become uh, very territorial and, and really can interfere with some of the collaborative nature you're driving for. So uh, the functional IT silos, if you will, uh, as this picture represents, is one of the biggest challenges that we face with organizations and helping them enable multi-cloud and drive that innovation. It's really reframing the way that they think and the way that they approach things. And so what we often suggest is instead of having kind of those um, – specific domain-focused teams like a network team, a security team, a development team, a testing and, and QA team that are siloed and, and really don't have any cross-pollination is, is taking pieces and parts and building around what I mentioned before, which is, is a solution team. And, and by design, the thought here is taking pieces of the business, the appropriate expertise across all of those IT pieces that I just mentioned in my last comment and building a comprehensive team that can understand all of those viewpoints that can then leverage all the different technology options at their disposal, being private data center, private cloud, co-location and edge scenarios, public cloud, and in whatever flavor that may be IaaS, PaaS, or SaaS options, and 
owning and controlling those things and driving the business forward at quite frankly a a rate of innovation that most organizations haven't haven't seen before uh, and they're struggling to keep up with. And so that brings us kind of full circle back to the conversation around given that higher level of ownership and driving it down to teams and letting them operate somewhat autonomously, how does an organization ensure that they're secure, ensure that they're compliant given whatever the restrictions uh, that they may face, and how does IT retain some semblance of control of the operations? And we really think that's where automation and monitoring play such a huge role in this new world. So while you build comprehensive teams that are going to ideate, develop, and own uh, solutions, how do you ensure that they're meeting um, the restrictions that, that the organization needs to put in place to ensure uh, that they're minimizing risk to it to the appropriate degree? And so the analogy I like to use here is whether you're a soccer fan or a football fan, whether it's a field or a pitch, if you can imagine establishing the sidelines and what's inbounds and outbounds, and that's really the role that IT wants to play in this new modern world is business is going to own technology. They're going to be involved in technology and technology decisions. But if you can establish the sidelines and tell them what is inbounds and out of bounds, you can now let those solution teams choose whatever plays that they want to run on the field. And then monitoring comes in, and that's kind of like the referee in my analogy. That's where you can ensure that folks are adhering to um, the rules of the game and staying inbounds um, and on your playing field. So when done appropriately, you now have teams that can operate as they best see fit and have flexibility in their day-to-day operations, uh, but IT still has that visibility and still has that ultimate control to ensure governance and compliance. And so lastly, um, to kind of summarize that, that concept, it starts to look like this from a big-picture perspective. So in the left-hand side of the slide, you can see all the external factors that businesses face. So the, the high rate of change of technology that we've already spoken about, um, the personnel challenges and um, considerations that an organization faces, uh, the business challenges and competition that exist in the world. So uh, rapidly changing uh, external factors uh, that really, I think, make it difficult for organizations to operate in that traditional five, seven-year um, planning cycles and where you're trying to make large hardware investments to to meet those those changing demands, but you're really having to forecast long term what you think those changes are going to manifest or how they're going to manifest. And so, by adopting some of the new technologies in cloud, you're now unlocking your ability to be more agile. You're unlocking access to the latest and greatest from technology advances, and you're really fostering uh, a mentality where you can experiment, you can fail fast and adjust without then suffering. Uh, either large capital investments and, and, and waste or having to be as um, intentional with where you use or leverage your valuable resources. So you really can build uh, and drive teams forward at, at a breakneck speed. And we really think it comes uh, in an intentional process. So certainly the, the most important part in the foundation of that pyramid you're seeing is, is your people. And, and, and that's your most important asset as an organization. So that's going to then drive some of the the other considerations as you move up the pyramid in the platforms and tools, the processes that are going to enable those, but it ultimately caps with a strategy uh, that, that encompasses all of those things that, as you can see, integrates the business and technology together. And we feel like that's where organizations are best enabled to adjust to the constant demands and, and, and rapid changes externally that they're, they're facing in today's market. And, and Michael, I think this is one area where, you know, in the past six months, folks have had to, you know, really reevaluate their, their IT strategy, uh, yeah. as many of, many of their people have not been able to come into the office and either, you know, require remote working or, you know, it, it becomes more and more difficult to, to manage, uh, a data center, right? And so I think this, this acceleration, you know, of, of, of that five to seven year plan into what can we execute in the next, you know, year, year and a half um, to alleviate some of the risks that may be out in the ecosystem. Uh, you know, it's something that we're hearing is, you know, is of utmost importance. Absolutely, Jeremy. Uh, and I think we've seen a, a lot of the same things. So organizations are now having to consider parts of their business that, that 
quite honestly, they never imagined being or, or having a, a remote act aspect to them. And uh, I think, you know, when at the beginning of this year, when when these things first started to come to fruition, we saw organizations plan for how do I bridge the gap, right? How do I put a Band-Aid on this and, 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 and limp along, if you will, until this is over? I think one of the most interesting things that we've seen and one of the lessons learned for organizations is they've they've lived through this is that conversation has changed. So what started out as a Band-Aid approach was how do I enable this to uh, continue to drive my organization regardless of how long this pandemic uh, may exist, but really um, leveraging some of the agility and some of the flexibility that they've had to account for to to drive, again, their their business critical mission or make them better at what they do. So uh, it's been interesting to see how that conversation has not only evolved in a short period of time, but, but also driven this, this adoption of a, a, an organizational acceleration, right. Or, or changing the way the organizations look at their business. Yeah, absolutely. And so, you know, we've certainly talked about some, some very big picture items and, and, you know, strategy can be um, somewhat squishy and ambiguous for organizations. So one of the things that we pride ourselves on at, at Worldwide is, is how we help organizations build a plan that fits both their long-term viewpoints and what they're trying to drive for, but is agile and iterative enough that they can, can really get started today and they can adjust on the fly. And so we think, as I mentioned back on the, the cloud adoption journey slide that we looked at several slides back, uh, but if by having that plan and baselining where you're at today, assessing or taking an inventory of the processes and tools you already have that can accelerate that journey, and then leveraging that to really propel yourself forward is the key, and then it becomes an iterative process to where you constantly reinspect and constantly baseline even as you're moving forward so you can continue and not lose some of that momentum. And so, as I mentioned before, it really starts with identifying the organizational strategy, right? And then ensuring that your technology initiative uh, supports that organizational strategy. And that's going to lead you down making an intentional decision around what platforms and tools that you have, whether it's ones that you already own today and, and are proficient in, what gaps may exist, and what opportunities you have to modernize. And then from there, layering in what that's going to or how that's going to impact uh, you from a, an organizational perspective, uh, and then ultimately back into what I mentioned before is your, your, your most precious asset, and that are your people, right? And so all of those things will evolve. And, and so here worldwide, we've developed a seven-step process to kind of build that plan. Uh, you can see uh, most of that process on the slide here. The one thing that's not called out is once you've gotten through kind of those first six steps, that's really where you build your migration plan. So now that I understand what I'm trying to achieve, I understand or have a good idea of what platforms and tools I, I think will be involved in my my modernization or, or my transformation, um, and I've got process in, in place to account for that. Now I can start to do determine things like fit for purpose for workloads and understand what should live where in that multi-cloud environment, what should remain in my data center or my private cloud, what should live in a public cloud and which public cloud, and then in what manner should it transform as it makes that journey to its new destination? Because as I mentioned earlier, there are a lot of challenges with a lift and shift approach to, to moving things because you miss out on several of the advantages uh, of, of technology advancement and what's readily available in the cloud. So by looking at how something should transform, whether it's being replatformed, whether it's being refactored, whether it's maybe even being retired and, and an organization should start consuming a cloud native service in its place. Those are all the things that we help organizations consider as part of their broad strategy. And again, that's where we partner very closely with Intel, uh, who's driving a lot of that innovation. And we've even developed um, joint plans to help customers in that journey, be it migrating workloads to new platforms, transforming workloads as they make that that um, or drive towards that innovation. Uh, and that's where our two organizations really come together to add additional value for customers. Thank you, Michael. I think in, in addition to, you know, the, the assessment, discovery, and migration planning work, I know one of the, the real differentiators for WWT is, is your advanced technology center. Um, how do you guys use uh, the ATC in, in helping to either, you know, educate uh, customers or, or make them aware of, of possible solutions that they may not have been 
either thinking about or they weren't really sure how it could help them um, and giving them an understanding of the technology that's available. Uh, Jeremy, I appreciate you calling that out. That's, uh, that's a great point. We, we see the Advanced Technology Center as uh, one of, if not our greatest differentiator as a partner to the customers we work with. And for the folks out there that may not be familiar, our Advanced Technology Center is uh, a little bit over $500 million investment we've made uh, here in our quarter- headquarters in St. Louis, Missouri, where we have enabled virtually every technology uh, an organization can imagine, both from legacy technologies that they may still have and have to consider in their environment to many of the most cutting edge uh, solutions that are out there and, and even a lot of things that, are, that aren't generally available as we have broad partnerships with all the major cloud providers, all the major OEM providers. Uh, as I've mentioned several times, our, our relationship with Intel to where we can enable all of those, we can really let customers come in and it, it becomes a, the world's greatest technology amusement park is probably the best way to describe it. So we can quickly start to simulate customers' real-life environments, again, across legacy technologies that are maybe aged or maybe not even be supported by a lot of the original vendors anymore, all the way through these cutting-edge technologies and help them understand how they fit together uh, to make educated decisions. So one of the easiest examples, I think, is, is what we talked about previously. An organization has a lot of tough choices when they start to look at adopting cloud or what cloud could potentially do for their organization. They have to consider the advantages of cloud native and and some of the ease of use that comes along with that versus where they already have investment and capabilities. So weighing things like third-party ISVs and how their technologies span private cloud and public cloud and really enable that true kind of hybrid experience. So we can stand them up side by side in the ATC. We can help customers see the, the advantages and disadvantages of each. Similarly, with a, a single cloud strategy versus a multi-cloud strategy, we have connectivity from the ATC to all the major cloud providers. We can simulate what those different scenarios look like. We can show them what workloads look both in a static siloed environment in a given cloud or given platform even versus what a dynamic application looks like that may span multiple platforms so that organizations can make an educated decision as they're kind of building this foundational piece or uh, if you're reading in this slide from the left to right approach to to how I enable my multi-cloud strategy, the ATC plays a significant part uh, all the way across that journey. Uh, with all the complexity uh, in this, in, in the available within the cloud market, I think one of the, the, the problems that, that causes people to stall is just confidence in the direction that they want to move is, is the right one and there's nothing better out there. I think seeing the different options within the ATC are sort of powerful to, to give you confidence and that the direction that you're choosing to go is the right one for you and your company. Completely agree. And so just to summarize, you know, what we've chatted about today, um, multi-cloud, we believe, is, is paramount for organizations to at least understand. Again, it may not be right for everyone, but understanding what the potential pluses and minuses of it uh, and, and how you avoid some of the plateaus that we mentioned, uh, I do think is, is valuable to every organization. And then for the organizations that, that do decide to move down the, the single cloud provider path or a multi-cloud path, um, understanding how you can take an intentional approach and avoid some of the common pitfalls uh, is, is of value. And we really think that, that both Intel and Worldwide are uniquely positioned to partner together and, and help organizations achieve just that. Because, you know, as, as it states here, it's really not a technology. It's, it's really enterprise transformation. It's going to impact not only how you budget and how you invest and in revenue considerations from uh, CapEx to OpEx models, to how you organize your teams and maybe how you even budget internally uh, versus large capital campaigns versus smaller distributed teams that really kind of can own their own fate and, and everything in between those two scenarios. So uh, taking that holistic approach, understanding how the impact and the considerations are going to come into play and working with an, an organization like Worldwide and Intel uh, and leveraging things like the ATC, we feel like can give organizations a considerable head start in their, their journey. So, uh, Michael, if, if what we've been talking about today has resonated with any of the customers that are listening, how can they get started with WWT? Thanks, Jeremy. Yeah, there's a couple options that I would recommend. Uh, certainly, they can visit our platform and our consulting services page that we have out there. It has lots of information uh, and additional articles and detail on several of the things that we've talked about. And 
Uh, I think there's things of value, whether uh, a customer is really at the very beginning of their journey and, and are really just starting to understand cloud, um, or if they're well on their way and, and, and maybe experiencing some of the, the challenges that, that we talked about. Uh, if they would like to get engaged and schedule a multi cloud briefing or speak to someone from Worldwide or Intel, they can reach out to the Contact Us alias that you see below. Okay, excellent. Thank you, gentlemen. That was great. That's all we have time for today. Thank you again to my guests, Michael Johnson of Worldwide Technology, Jeremy Weinstein of Intel Corporation. For additional information on this topic, please visit the resources section on your screen. And thanks for joining us. For IDG, Worldwide Technology, and Intel, I'm Barbara Call.